My name is Donald Scott. Uh, I have a PhD degree in electrical engineering, which I used uh, to teach at the University of Massachusetts for 39 years. And uh, during that time, my interest had nothing to do, uh, with one exception, with any of the stuff that I'm doing now in the, in the electric universe. I have always been an amateur astronomer. I was one of these young kids who built their own telescope at age 15 and you know, that kind of stuff. Very, very, uh, not, not a very precision telescope, but it was a lot of fun. But when I got to retire in 90, 1998, and we moved out here uh, to uh, Arizona, we actually didn't move to this area, we moved to Tucson. And um, I was able to get enough land there to have the builder who built our house also build a little shed next door so I have my own observatory. And it wasn't a very good uh, telescope or mount or whatever, but I, I had fun. And then uh, in a few years, my daughter moved out here with her husband and we got a telephone call one night and uh, she said, Dad, uh, we moved 3,000 miles to be closer to you. We living, we're living here in Phoenix. Could you move 100 miles to be close, close to us? But anyway, we did it and uh, I'm very happy we, we did because I'm, both my wife and I are part of our grandchildren's lives now and that's, that's great. Uh, having the chance after I got through teaching to do what I wanted to do, I got that little observatory. We had one in, in Aurora Valley when we lived down in T near the Tucson area, and we also bought, built one up here when, when I built the, this, this house we're living in now. I didn't know much about astronomy, a little bit like any amateur does, but uh, I wasn't certainly an, any kind of expert in astronomy at all. But then uh, I got involved with, got to know, uh, Dave Talbot and Wall and uh, a few of the other folks and just got more and more and more interested in it. I guess the culmination of it was it, one day, just before, well, I guess it was back about 19, it was in the 70s, 1970 or so. So it was 20 years at least before I retired, but it was I was well into my work. Uh, I used to get magazines that would come across my desk. And uh, one of the magazines that always came across was one called Industrial Research. And it turned out to be an industrial engineering magazine. And I often said, why, do, why are these guys sending me this? I'm an electrical engineer, not an industrial engineer. But I would always uh, sort of leaf through it. And sometimes it was something of interest. All of a sudden, one day I spotted an article. And the title of the article, if I remember rightly, was, Is the Photosphere the Top or the Bottom of the Surface of the Sun? And it was written by a guy whose name was Ralph Jurgens. And uh, Jurgens has since become my hero. He's passed away. But he came up with a model, uh, rough at, at the time, but a, a model that explained all sorts of things about the surface of the sun. Um, what, the, so what, what were these, uh, what do they call them? Uh, the astronomers have a name for it. We call them anode tufts, but uh, granules. They were photo photospheric granules. Well, why is the surface of the sun granular? Well, that's one question. Um, why, when you come out from the sun, the photosphere is in, in, oh, in a typical temperature, I guess they say, is something around, oh, seven, 6,000 Kelvin. The sunspots are about uh, was as low as 3,000 Kelvin, but then as you come farther out, that temperature, it begins to drop down like you would expect as you go farther and farther from a wood stove, it gets cooler, not hotter. And it, it drops down to, I forget what the minimum that it typically gets to, but then all of a sudden shoots up to 2 million Kelvin. Now, I mean, 2 million degrees is a heck of a lot hotter than 6,000 degrees. That's not the part, the, the, the order of magnitude is not the question. The question is why when you get farther away does it get hotter? That's something that's nuts. I looked at Jurgen's model and uh, one thing led to another and I developed, I sort of advanced Jurgen's model. I extended it, if you will, to explain why. Because those, his structure you know, was enabled a charged particle to accelerate. And if you think of water coming over a dam, like a sluice gate coming down, when it hits the bottom, it's going very, very rapidly. And it's traded 
uh, potential energy that it's got at the top of the dam to kinetic energy, which is speed at the bottom. So the, the position is changed into, into velocity. And that explains why, because when that stuff is coming out of the sun, if it's a bunch of photons and it hits a bunch of either neutral or either other, other particles in a plasma, uh, there are collisions. And temperature, most people don't know what temperature is. They, oh, it's hot out today. You know, Arizona, we know all about that. But uh, heat really is a measure of the energy, the vibrational energy in something. So you need a gas or something. You can say, well, what's the temperature of that gas? Well, it's 2 million Kelvin. That's what the corona of the sun is. That's okay. Uh, if you go out into deep space and you say there's absolutely nothing there, well, what's the temperature of that? There is no temperature. It's not defined because there's nothing out there moving. If you can put a few things out there and see how rapidly they're moving around, then you can talk about temperature. I developed a, a, a little, what I call a, a transistor model of the sun, because the sun, uh, in using Jurgens' original model, with my some slight additions to it, uh, it's, it's obvious. I love to teach by analogies. I've always taught by analogies. So there's an analogy there between the, that, that diagram that Jurgens came up with and the way at PNP transistor I know about transistors, I didn't know about the sun, but I recognized that the mechanism was similar. And so, uh, for example, um, there was one day, it was several years ago, I think it was back in around, I don't quote me on this, but it's around 2008, 2009, something like that. The, um, the solar wind, that is the flow of those particles from the sun, stopped, shut off. And now if, if the, why would that be? I mean, if, if the sun just makes all this stuff by nuclear fusion and all this, you mean the nuclear fusion process just one day said, hey, we're going on strike today, shut it off. No, that's, it can't happen. But, it, but a transistor, if you change the, what's called the, the base emitter voltage, you can clamp it off and stop the current from flowing through it. So my analogy was that those, uh, those um, what should I say, photospheric tufts and, and, and photospheric structure that Jurgens had postulated originally in his original model, that they did indeed act like a transistor. And if they, one of those areas increased its voltage ever so slightly, it could indeed cut off the solar wind. So that I, I submit that, so, that Jurgens' model, with my little addition to it, uh, is able to explain all sorts of things, that temperature minimum and maximum because of the acceleration, the shutting off of the solar wind, um, the acceleration of the solar wind. After the solar wind leaves, it actually goes faster. Now, if you, you, know, if you spray a garden hose, the droplets in the garden hose are not going faster the farther away they get. They're getting slower. But uh, if you think about a charged particle in an electric field, yeah, it accelerates. And so... The surface of the sun is very electrical, and uh, I think thinking about it that way, we've been able to explain some things that uh, regular astronomers, helio astronomers, have have no no explanation for. That's a good question. Um, everybody asks that question of me when I talk about Birkeland currents going from one galaxy to another. Well, gee, what is that? How the light years of, of, of these, these, these things really long and it's got a really a lot of current in it. What makes it go? And where is that source of energy? And uh, I don't think anybody knows. I mean, that's, all I can say is we, we have to recognize reality and that is the way things really work. It's kind of like, if you want an analogy, it's kind of like two fish swimming in the middle of the Mississippi River and one fish looks at the other and says, where the heck does all this water come from? They have no idea about the fact that it rained in Wisconsin and therefore down here in Kentucky, we, we, you know, it's, it's so big a question that there's almost no answer to it. Uh, it's got to come from somewhere. You're right. No, not, not, no. If anything, 
And this is a very controversial item right now. Is, is the, the astronomers think that the uh, ever since the days of around 1900, when Eddington said, I know how a star works, it produces energy by nuclear fusion, and uh, hydrogen turns into helium. And uh, Ralph Jurgens came along and said, it's possible. He didn't say it is, but it's possible that the sun is a node in an electrical circuit. And if current is coming into the sun, and then it's, it's changed in the sun, and then it radiates out from the sun, he speculated and proposed that if the sun were, I forget how many volts the uh, charge it had, um, that it would, there are enough electrons in the vicinity of the sun to uh, convert that electrical power, which is energy per second, uh, into the amount of power coming out of the sun. That's still an unanswered question. We do know, like I was saying before about the acceleration of the, of, the, uh, of the solar wind and all that sort of thing, that the sun is, on its surface at least, it is very electrical and, and can, it, its actions can be explained very nicely by electrical treatment. Whether or not the total power of the sun comes from electrical current that the sun is getting through a Birkeland current from the galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy, which is very possible. Uh, that's a possibility, but right now it's only a possibility, we don't know.